And welcome again to Nurses Talk. We're tackling tough issues in healthcare, important topics from real perspectives from real nurses. My name is Lisa Tomka. With me, as always, is Carrie, Nurse Carrie, Nurse Kevin. Welcome back. Good morning. We're going to tackle a tough topic today. Uh, it's one that's often unspoken, even in healthcare circles. Um, it's about ethics, about ethics during a disaster. Tsunami happened in Japan. Uh, earthquake in Haiti, uh, Hurricane Irene, the storm that um, destroyed Joplin, Missouri. But both Carrie and Kevin um, have had experience with this. Carrie? Well, my experience is just from someone who's done work down in Haiti and down at the um, hospitals there and already knowing the culture and the poor and then seeing this earthquake hit and um, days later still seeing people laying unattended or with severed, you know, extremities and effect. not Absolutely. having um, the ability to clean up. So not only the disaster, but now the worry of disease as these folks are basically dead in the streets. And it developed. Now they're struggling how many years, year and a half later? Year and a half cholera later. Because Correct. It's, it's the lingering effects of something like this that we don't often think of. And you survived um, Hurricane Irene back in September. Yeah, it became a non-event happily in my area, but other parts, obviously, mm -hmm. further up the coast, it was not. But um, we had to do some emergency preparedness meetings because our population that we take care of are very, very frail elders, and they get home care on the weekends. And the hurricane mm -hmm. was supposed to come in mm -hmm. on Saturday, so forth and so on. And the meetings were about what will we do, to what extent we'll be able to provide care, and at what point do we say we can't? To help all of us better understand ethics in a disaster, we've invited a nurse expert, Dr. Katherine Schrader. Welcome to Nurses Talk. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, so can you help us understand what does it mean to be a doctor in nursing? Okay. I, I actually started my nursing career as an operating room nurse, or what's called now a perioperative nurse. So I did a lot of information and in caring for patients and teaching in the um, perioperative setting. But I went back to school. I studied education, and I received a master's in education. Then I decided I was really interested in ethical <coughs> issues. So I ended up teaching ethics, and I got a degree in bioethics and developed that. And then finally... Was that I, your master's? That was a master's in bioethics. And then I ended up going to... Um, a PhD program, a doctoral program in nursing with my focus of study on nursing and ethics Wonderful. together. So I ended up getting a doctorate in nursing and can be called Dr. Nurse. Be Dr. Nurse, and that makes you an expert, I would say. I, I am a clinical ethicist, especially because of my training in, in bioethics. Um, I currently serve in a position as a clinical ethicist at a hospital. So, so, so then, I mean, we were we started our talk about uh, disaster ethics. So, what does that mean? What is that? What is ethics in disasters or healthcare ethics in a disaster? Well, I, what does that mean? First, you'd have to identify, you know, what is a disaster to set your stage, and there are different types of disasters that impact on the healthcare system. Um, one would be um, a natural disaster, such as. Um, hurricanes, tornadoes, flooding, things like that. And then there's uh, biological, such as what you could say would be a pandemic from a flu, um, like the measles, um, all sorts of different... This movie contagion, right? Some deadly exactly. disease. Exactly. I mean, what, but it's, we've, we've, in essence, had contagion in the 1918 right. flu pandemic when the Spanish influenza hit the world, and millions of people perished in that, during that that. Pandemic. So what, well, what does it mean then to say, I mean, I think most of us, or I think most of the public, right, would think that we are eth we're ethical, we're, e we're nurses, we're doctors, we're ethical. Mm -hmm. So why do we even need, uh, why do we even need to have this conversation, right. I guess? We're used to providing care within our standards of practice and standards of care that we, f we follow on a day-to-day -day basis. And on any given day, we may, our healthcare system, we may be strained a little bit, 
but eventually we work it out. We get we borrow from another hospital. We get things we need, and we get the patients what they need. Use another ED if our yeah, EDs are we filled, can't, we'll, or we yes. send them someplace else. Right, right. There's nothing. There's you know we we run out pharmacy, of some piece of equipment. We borrow from a, another hospital close by. During times of disaster, especially a pandemic, all the hospitals, all the areas hospitals where we, we would get our supplies will also be feeling that same crunch with the resources we might not be able to get what we know would be the best the best items or give the patients the quality of care that we are conditioned to give and that's part of our, our practice and that we're conditioned to accept as patients and as and patients our expectations as oh, patients the, absolutely yes, the expectations is nowadays people could come to the emergency department at any time and they really don't think they'll be turned away if we go to the hospital, someone will see us. We we'll, might we'll take get me some kind of hours care. in the emergency department, but but eventually some, I'll be seen. Eventually I'm going to get in. But in a disaster, we might not have that the same capacities. Mm -hmm. There might be a lot of different reasons why the hospital can't function. Their power might be out. They may maybe unlimited power. It depends on what's going on. It sounds like where you're heading, where we're heading, or the need for is some sort of an ethical way to say, it's okay. There's an ethical way to look at the fact that you may not get the care you think you are you should get because this all, all these other things are going on. They, we've had this disaster. Everyone is strained. Go to the hospital if you want, but you may not get the care that you need, which A, is too bad, sad, mm -hmm. tragic mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. But you're saying, it sounds like what you're saying, that we need to develop an ethical framework to say why that's okay for a healthcare provider to say, we can't. I've worked on a, a panel, on an expert panel for disaster ethics in the state of Wisconsin over the past several years. And what we came up with was to try to define what is disaster ethics, because we hadn't really come up with a uniform definition. And we came up with a, um, a definition that mainly says it's a set of principles and values that serve to direct the duties, obligations, and parameters of the delivery of health care in a disaster situation. So it's a way of looking at how we care for patients in this specific situation, which is not our norm. It's not our normal way right. of caring. It's it's similar. It's really similar to, in essence, in wartime. The situation in wartime. You again, they may have limited supplies, and they're caring for people who are injured on a field of battle, and they only have so much. Well, and we even ran into uh, with the H one N one. There were limited vaccines. Right. Okay, and that kind of starts a little panic. And it, it, that's just on a little on a vaccine. Right. What happens if clean water is gone? What happens if you know, this is bigger than that. For anyone who's ever traveled on an airplane, to see the behavior of people just for overhead bin space, you would think you were asking someone to donate a kidney. <laughs> I mean, right? Right? Public people think that um, nurses care for patients, doctors care for patients. And that we will always be there. And we'll them. always be there. Right. But there are times when we're not there. For example, sometimes when, when the hospitals are told to evacuate during maybe a hurricane's coming. So that leaves the hospital maybe short on, on staff. So when, the, when public members come in, now they're coming into the hospital thinking everybody's there to man the hospital. They're not, they and may to not take have care a full of them. Right. right. They right. don't have a full staff. And the ER staff might say, well, you know, if you can walk in, you can just walk back home because we can't care for you. We can't provide you care at this time because you're kind of in, in a good enough shape. Right. Would you kind of say that we're not used to that in America, that we would oh, be told? Gosh. I mean, we, you know, we're we, wanted, we to triage on a good day, but we're not used to being told, you can walk in right you now, sir, you can walk home. It, that would be, a, I can imagine a patient, that would be shocking. That would be totally yeah. shocking to anybody in America. And, and this is where they need to get the information out that if we truly have a disaster, you may be actually turned away if you if you come to the hospital and you have and your injuries are deemed as or triaged as minor you you might be turned away we asked some experienced nurses their thoughts on the subject let's go hear what they had to say i believe that the responsibility of a healthcare provider uh, in a disaster or pandemic is to offer the knowledge that their profession brings them do you stay with your family? Do you help your neighbors? What do you do in those situations? Do you risk your life to get to a health care center? If you're going to be there for 24 hours, who's taking care of your children? Who's taking care of your elderly parents? And these nurses have to make the decision whether the resources are going to meet the common good, the, the, the good of the whole, as opposed to the individual who's more critical 
who needs them first, who can wait, who will not benefit from those resources. And of course, after the triage is over, we have to live with the decisions that were made. So there are all of these layers and levels that require professional expertise to do the best job that we can. There is no perfect triage. People do the best they can. You know, that's part of being a nurse. So those clips of that the nurses and the gave and the responses, um, it sounds like where we're heading, and you alluded to it earlier, is we have a standard of care that we operate, we practice from, that, but that in times of disaster, there's a, it's okay that we alter our standard of care. Is that what we're, is that Ex what we're hearing? Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. It seems that um, as nurses, we, we're used to providing care in a certain way. And right. when we, even, even nowadays, if we feel we were rushed or didn't get a chance to do everything we wanted to do, we as nurses feel we've compromised our patient. Right, we, right, in, right. in essence, we have, you know, a, we kind today. of go through yeah. an aspect of moral distress yeah, where we think, right. you know, I didn't care for my patient appropriately. Well, in a disaster, it's a given that we will not have all the things that we need to provide the same standard of care that we would on any other normal day in health care. Mm -hmm. So we have to function under what we, we're calling right now is an altered standard of care. It doesn't mean it's unethical. It means we have to alter it for each situation where we're dealing with a disaster of whatever, of ever, whatever sort so that we, ha we provide the best care possible given that situation. And we have to be able to, as nurses, realize that this is ethical care for us in this time. Mm -hmm. And the public has to realize that this is the best we can do, and it's ethically appropriate. The, the theory of utilitarianism, we try to provide the greatest good for the greatest number in these instances, mm -hmm. realizing that we may have situations where we won't have enough ventilators. If, we had, if everyone in the United States had a, a high level of flu where they needed ventilators, we may not have enough right. ventilators. It would be similar to... The Titanic did not have enough lifeboats life on it. They could right. not have imagined. This, because we don't really think we'll get to that point. That's the problem. We don't really think about that. And, and the public, why would they expect that we don't have supplies? You go to a hospital and you have supplies. Well, we, I would say that we have many situations of this happening all the time, like mm -hmm. with solumedrol and looking at which patients can have it and which can't. You mm -hmm. hear that conversation behind the scenes in hospitals all the time. Sure. And sometimes families are aware of it because they say, well, why is my father or mother not receiving the same treatment? There's a very long list of medications right. now that are not going to be available. And the pharmacy industry wasn't being required until the, the day it was due to be delivered to a hospital. Mm -hmm. But that was the day that they announced that we don't have it. In a disaster, we really have to get beyond that. Mm -hmm. so we really have to pool our resources so, so we can treat as many as possible. And they're not used to doing that, clearly. When no. you say that, it makes me think this, is, this must be news on some level, to a population. Like what? Like, like you don't work what, together? You guys don't work together? You don't work You're together? not collaborating to make no. sure that that hospital has this and we can get that when no. we need it? Right. And So how do we move the public, or what kind of public education needs to right. happen? And that's where I think states are, are putting together um, panels to educate mm -hmm. the public. First, they have to come to agreements on what are, what what aspect of disaster planning and disaster preparedness will they follow in this state? What will work for them? And they have to make sure they have everyone on board, you know, the American Hospital Association, or the, the state, Wisconsin Hospital, the state hospital, Wisconsin Association, hospital Association, the American, um, I mean, the emergency medical system. Right. They have to have EMS on board. They have to have everybody, public health. Mm -hmm. You know, during a, during a disaster, we'll, say we had we'll a pandemic, say we had a, a flu pandemic. You know, part of it is keeping the pandemic from spreading. Right. So what might happen during a flu pandemic? Well, places where a lot of people gather or congregate, such as school, Elementary will be schools, closed. Right? Okay, now you have kids that were in school. They, they can't go to school now because they, you risk getting the flu. So now they're at home. Well, who's going to take care of them at home? What if you, the, the parents work? Maybe they work at the hospital. Now, oh, I'm a nurse. I'm a doctor. I have to go to the hospital. But now my kids are home. Now I got to find someone to watch my kids, but I can't because the house next to me is quarantined for flu. Right. So now you have the public health department. They're going to be on TV. They're going to be notifying the public. And it, the public has the responsibility to know what's going on. Exactly. And speaking of that, we'll go back to our nurses who we interviewed, asking them about what, what can the public do in preparation for something like mm -hmm. this. And so let's hear what they had to say. 
The public needs to understand that it's their responsibility to start thinking about what they might do in a disaster. They have to be involved. They have to be involved in their community. They have to know what sort of the plan is in their community and their neighborhoods. And they need to make sure that they have the discussions in their family sessions, in their communities, in their churches, in their synagogues. They need to have a discussion about this, the sort of what if. What if this happened? What would we do? You know, would I save my two-and-a-half-week-old grandchild or would I save my 91-year-old mother? Those are things that you need to think about beforehand. And I think for the general public, that's a very difficult decision, but it needs to be uh, discussed, it needs to be thought about. Do I have the supplies that I need on hand? Um, have I thought through um, about where things are located? Well, during the Katrina uh, uh, hurricane, people were told to evacuate. So they went to their cars and they threw just about everything that they could get into the car into it as they evacuated and found when they left they didn't have the things they needed. But just think through some of the things that you might need if your family had to survive on its own for a week. And think about putting those together and then you would be ready for a disaster just as your government and the healthcare institutions around you are. Catherine, is there anything else the public needs to know to prepare for a disaster or pandemic? Well, I think one of the things that's really important is to know what things do they need to have in their home should a disaster, a natural disaster occur. And a place they can go to is call the Red Cross in their area, or they can go to the Red Cross website, which is www.redcross.org, and they'll be able to find the information about um, what do they need? Flashlights, candles, so what supplies should they keep in their home in case of a type of disaster where they're going to be homebound or in case of a pandemic where they might be quarantined in their home? Um, the other thing they can do is contact or look up online their state uh, regulations related to um, preparedness for disaster. Right. Each state has um, a, a form of that type of a council committee, a government branch that addresses that. They can also go to uh, www.flu.gov and find out. And that's also a website for professionals, for nurses and physicians to look at. Gives a lot of information on, on the flu and what's currently um, occurring with that. That would really help debunk some of the myths too mm -hmm. that the community at large has around the flu vaccination. Right, right. And and every season, uh, flu can vary right. and different strains can evolve and we need to be ready for it. And um, there's one more website that I would suggest the that public can okay. access and it's www.ready.gov and it's to get ready for disasters. Mm -hmm. And again, they'll give you a lot of information. We'll have access to uh, or links to all of these great websites where you can get more information on www.nursestalk.com. Catherine, it has been a pleasure. Thank you for helping us learn more about this today. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to be here. Thanks, Catherine. You know, Nurses Talk isn't just about covering important healthcare topics and learning about things like disaster ethics. It's also about learning about the profession of nursing. And we have a lot of different backgrounds in nursing. For example, Carrie, what's yours? Oncology or cancer care. Cancer care. Kevin? I started in the ICU, and then I became an adult and geriatric nurse practitioner. So the two of you are different. Catherine, Dr. Catherine Schrader, who was on previously, shared with us that she's an operating nurse by background. I'm a mental health nurse. So there are a lot of things you can do with nursing. And um, in keeping with our theme today, we thought that we would invite a flight nurse. Um, you know, nurses don't just work in the hospitals. They don't just work in clinics. Sometimes they fly in the sky, and we're not exactly sure what they do. So let's invite Chief Flight Nurse Kyle Madigan from the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Advanced Response Team. Kyle, welcome to Nurses Talk. Thank you very much. Oh, man. Carrie, keep your hands off. So tell us, we, what does it mean to be a flight nurse? To be a flight nurse is um, a subspecialty of nursing, obviously, and there's two different ways um, one could be a flight nurse, either in a, in a fixed wing or an airplane type environment where you're generally taking patients from one facility to another facility, or you could be a rotor wing nurse or a helicopter flight nurse, which is what I do predominantly. And so as a, as a helicopter flight nurse, we respond to both um, accidents, 
on the side of the road, out in the country, wherever that injury or, or, or traumatic event might have occurred, and transport them directly to uh, a higher level of care, a, a trauma center, we would say. We also do some inter-facility transfer where we'll go out to local hospitals, rural or regional hospitals, and pick up injured or ill patients and, again, bring them to the tertiary care or higher level of care um, that, say, a teaching hospital or an academic medical center might offer. I have to tell you and reveal that when I was in the ICU, the, the flight pad was right above our wing and so you guys would be delivering patients to us and I always secretly wanted to just leave and go back with when you were going back to the helicopter because it looked like it a seems very glamorous doesn't a very it? exciting uh, yeah, aspect of nursing. So is there other nurses that fly with you or do you fly with a physician? Across the industry the the main mode or, or model of the transport team is a nurse and a paramedic as the two care providers but okay. different flight programs um, can, can change that up to meet the needs of the population that they serve. And so you will see some programs that will fly with a nurse and a physician, or others that fly with two nurses, or maybe a nurse and a respiratory therapist. Again, it just, um, they cater to the patient population. Okay. So if, you, if, if somebody were considering nursing, and then considering flight nursing, what would be the logical path Yeah, how do you get there? How do you get Because I bet it's just not, you don't just graduate from nursing school and you're a flight nurse. No, it's not a, a place that we um, entertain uh, new graduate nurses. Nice. We look for the person to have um, at least three to five years of critical care experience. Preferably, that would be in a larger institution that sees a higher acuity, perhaps a higher volume of patients. We would also like uh, a person that has a combination of ICU, like Kevin has, as well as some ED experience. Mm -hmm. And that ICU experience could be specialized as, say, a cardiac or a medical intensive care unit, or even a combination. Um, we see a lot of patients through a broad age range. And so if you have pediatric experience, if you have adult experience, it certainly helps. So once you have that core three to five years of experience, we also look for people to have what I call the alphabet soup. ACLS or Advanced Cardiac Life Support, PALS, Pediatric Advanced Life Support, um, CPR, uh, neonatal uh, resuscitation. And so once you have those core experiences and certifications, that's the time when people can generally start to apply for a job. It also would help if they have some sort of pre-hospital experience. A lot of people that go into this as a nurse were either a, an EMT or a paramedic before they were a nurse or, or while they've been a nurse because of that pre-hospital component to the job where we do go to the scene of an accident. So does, is it a bachelor's prepared nurse or is it an advanced practice nurse that's in the role? Traditionally, it is a, um, a, an ADN or, or a BSN bachelor's prepared nurse. We are now seeing with the explosion of um, nurse practitioner programs, and especially the acute care nurse right. practitioner, we're starting to see some of those nurses um, beginning to come into the role of flight nurse. It still is not the predominance, but we're seeing a transition in the industry over the past five or so years. So it'll be interesting to see in the future where it really goes. But right now it's um, a registered nurse and, and an EMT paramedic. So is there a personality that's drawn to Oh, this that's a really good nursing. question. That's the, who, who are you, Kyle? Well. <laughs> <laughs> What's interesting about it is we tend to have um, a lot of people drawn to this that are the go-getters, the, um, the overachievers of their department, of their um, program. We tend to have the people that interview for our type of work they're the people that are the resource person in their department. They are the... The go-to person, exactly. right? Exactly. And so the other piece of it is that they're rather type A personalities. We work in a very uncontrolled environment, and so we try to control whatever it is that we can possibly control. And so that's, that's just our nature. We want to um, get everything tidy and neat in the way we want it, the way we like to care for patients. And in such an austere environment, that's not always possible. So you're kind of like adrenaline junkies and control freaks all at the same time? Really? I mean, really? That's a good way to put it, Lisa. Okay. Thank you. I'm so here to help. So what do you do when, you're, when there's not a trauma call? 
Yeah, we used to see you sitting around having coffee yeah, in the cafeteria. Yeah, in teams. So. And we want, I wanted to touch you when I would see you. I'd go, it's a dark you know man, that I want to touch get asked him. that question quite a bit. What do you do when you're not flying? What do you do? Well, you know, there's a lot of restocking. There's a lot of um, continuing education. There's a lot of patient follow-up. We do uh, quality projects to uh, maintain the high level of patient care and, and patient quality that we provide. And so while it seems as though we're not doing a whole lot, there really is a lot of things going on behind the scenes that isn't always evident. Uh, a helicopter is a huge uh, billboard for a hospital. And you would be surprised at the number of people that stop by that want to see the helicopter. We generally encourage people when we interact with them in their time of crisis, when you get better, when you're feeling better, come on down and take a look at this because there's a good chance you probably won't remember, remember any, any of this of flight right, whatsoever. Right, right. And so we do see a lot of people coming back down saying, hey, I, I flew on that helicopter. Could I see it? And they really don't remember a whole lot of the flight. Speaking of flying on the helicopter, when I thought I wanted to at one time, I, then I found out I had to get on a scale <laughs> because there was sort of a weight limit. So that went right out. No one needs to know how much I weigh. I don't care who you are. So tell us about, like, are there physical restrictions for this or what, you know, besides your personality, what do you have to be physically to do it? Right. What's interesting about a helicopter is that there's only a limited amount of weight that a helicopter can lift. And so everything that you put into the helicopter takes away from how much the helicopter can lift. So when you're sitting at your pad at the hospital or your base, you try to have as much gas in it as you can possibly have, so you have as much distance that you can go out to pick up a patient and fly them back. And so all of that equals um, weight for the helicopter. Well, then you have to add in the crew. So you have the pilot's weight, the nurse's weight, and the paramedic's weight. Most programs institute some sort of a weight limit policy I would say a good um, estimate across the board is about 100 kilograms in all the flight suit with your helmet, with anything that you put in all of these pockets, you have to be weighed. How Different, many pounds is that? The, how many pounds? That's about 220 pounds. Would there ever be a patient that you would go to go pick up in a trauma that would be too, that you would actually yeah. then be too heavy to, yeah. you couldn't go take them back to the hospital? Absolutely. What would you do? And what would, ha what do you do with Talk that? Talk about the triage. Yeah, really. Right. Talk about the ethics of that. So um, we are limited because the, the size of the helicopter cannot change. It's static, and so we can only fit a person that will fit into the, the, the space that we have. Our stretcher is also um, rated for a certain amount of weight, and so we can't take, uh, on the, the helicopter that I work on, we can't take a patient that weighs greater than 350 pounds on our stretcher. Mm -hmm. And it's, a, it's an added level or layer of safety that we put into our operations because safety really is the guiding principle of what we do. Um, although I would say and have to plead that I, I have one of the best jobs in nursing, flying around in a helicopter, helping out injured or ill patients, um, and getting them back to a, a tertiary care facility is very, very rewarding and very exciting. But getting home safely at the end of my shift is really my risky, ultimate man. goal. Yeah. And so um, safety has to be the paramount foundation that you operate on each and every call. There's really no la layer or level of, of complacency that you can tolerate in this line of work. Um, because it's so different than, than other types of nursing. Mm -hmm. Well, and kind of just briefly, just tying this back to when Dr. Schrader was talking about the ethics and the duty to self and the duty of the patients, as much as you'd love to take off sometimes, right, it's a really serious accident. If, if you can't, you can't, Correct. right, that, because of your safety. So you have and to stay. And who makes that call? Yeah, who makes that? That's a great question. So, that is a good question. And so at the program where I work, at Dartmouth-Hitchcock, we have built in a lo level of safety there as well in that... Uh, a request will come into our dispatch center um, to fly to uh, an accident scene on, on the roadway. The dispatch center will give the information to the pilot and say, we have a flight to mile marker 25 on route 89. And they give them no patient information whatsoever. It's, can you accept it for oh. weather oh, to get yeah. to that point yeah. and so come it's back? like you're almost blinded yeah. to the, what the what deal the, is. Yeah. Exactly. And then when the pilot either accepts the mission or declines the mission, then they say, all right, you're going for a motor vehicle accident, it's an adult male, because we don't want the pilot's emotions to be part of the decision making oh, in whether or not we can do the call. That's interesting. But what if it's really an acute 
thing. Can they bypass the pilot and get your opinion as a nurse of what is? I know. Can't it doesn't make sound it? like it does. It. I count. think it falls back to that ultimate level of safety. That if we can't go from point A to point B and back safely in the air, then we can't do the mission. So everybody loves a story. So do you have a, a story about a, a run or a, 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 a trip in your mind, that yeah. it leaps to your mind? I have a really great story. Um, this happened a number of years ago um, when I was a flight nurse out in California. And we went to a call for a, a head-on collision on, on a roadway that the roadway's pretty high speed. It's a, I think the speed limit is 60 miles an hour. And so the two cars collided head-on and uh, one person was entrapped uh, upside down in the car. So when we landed on the scene, the firefighters were there using the jaws of life, trying to open up the car to get access to the, the gentleman who was um, entrapped upside down in his vehicle. The steering wheel was crushing his legs and his lap. Um, he had broken both of his legs. Um, he was kind of in and out of consciousness. And so limited access, we got, we got an IV in his arm and we got some oxygen on him, but we really couldn't do a whole lot You're of care. You're doing this while he's upside down? Correct. Oh my Lord. So we stood by and let the firefighters do their job because we're part of the bigger team. We're, we're one piece of the big team here. So after about an hour of cutting this gentleman's car apart, they were able to get him out of the vehicle. So when we pulled him out of the vehicle, we laid him down on the stretcher to get him immobilized, the cervical collar and the head blocks like you do for, for trauma patients. And he went into cardiac arrest. And so we started our life-saving um, resuscitation and we um, did all that we could for him. And we were able to resuscitate him. We got him in the helicopter and he went into cardiac arrest again en route to the trauma center. And this happened two or three times on the way. So by the time we got him to the trauma center, he had arrested or, or his heart had stopped beating as he had stopped breathing on us three or four times. Well, we dropped him off at the, the trauma center and trauma team and the trauma surgeon was there waiting for him. One of the, the drawbacks I would say to my job is that's where we what end happened? scene. Right, yeah. right. Off he went and you, you always kind of wonder because we don't work at that hospital. Our base was somewhere else. And so we never really followed up. We didn't know what happened to this gentleman. Well, fast forward about two years and I was working at the same base. I was waiting in between calls. There's a knock on the door and I walked out and I opened the door and there's an elderly gentleman standing oh, no. there with a plate of cookies and oh, a cane. Oh God. And he said, I just wanted to stop by and thank the crews here because you guys saved my life a couple of years ago and, and I can't thank you enough. And I said, really, you know, thank you so much. Come on in, you know, tell me about, you know, your, your injury or your accident. And he starts to recount this story. And he remembers yeah, Did you a lot die of it? right there? Did and you so just die? He, um, he didn't know at the time that I was on that call, but the more he told me about it, the more I was, oh, I would have just this was, lost you, it right there. I was your, your nurse yeah. that day. And so um, he, spent, he spent three months in the hospital. He had multiple surgeries. Doesn't remember anything about the accident or about the first week. But the fact that he came back with, a, with something as simple as a plate of cookies, you know, that's what makes it all worthwhile. That's the best part of the job, hey? That's yeah. awesome, so that was a, Kyle. That was a fantastic call. And, you know, not all calls end up that no. nice. Um, but that's really what nursing is about, is, is making a difference in a patient's life. Yeah, it sure, sure is. Absolutely. It's, Kyle, uh, our audience, like, I want to be a flight nurse. Is there some place they can go? You have a national association, correct? You were the president of the national association. What was that? Yes, I was. Um, the national association is called the Air and Surface Transport Nurses Association. And so we represent those nurses that either fly in an airplane or a helicopter or do transport by ground ambulance, water ambulance, whatever it might be. That must be, be an uptight conference. <laughs> <laughs> Control freaks and yeah, adrenaline everywhere. junkies everywhere. What do you do? ASTNA.org would be the ASNA website. And um, our mission is to... Um, to provide quality patient care and enhance the um, role of the transport nurse. We're very focused on education. We have a uh, nationally recognized trauma class called the uh, Transport Nurse Advanced Trauma Course, which teaches 
transport nurses how to deal with patients with critical injuries. And is there a certification? In there is. There is? There's actually two certifications. Well, I see the letters after your RN on yeah. your badge. Right. We have the certified flight nurse as well as the certified transport nurse. So CFRN or CTRN. And again, it's to recognize both of those different specialties, right. whether or not you're doing air medical transport or perhaps you're doing ground critical care transport. So we have two different certifications. And some people have both, or you can get one or the other. Um, and you can get more information about that at www.bcen.org. We could talk about this forever, I think. And the one thing I've learned, I love the look of a nurse in a flight suit. <laughs> the helmet is the bomb. <laughs> that is awesome. Kyle Madigan, RN, thank you for joining us on Nurses Talk. This has been awesome. Thank you very much for having me. This has Thanks, been great. Man. Join us next time. We're going to keep on going with important topics. We're going to bring more careers in nursing to the audience so they can understand the diversity that is the profession of nursing. See you next time.